Hey, I am a CEO and co-founder at Control Plane. We are a cloud native security consultancy. Uh, we do security audits, pen testing, consulting, and love to run capture the flag events. We do those at KubeCon every six months or so. Uh, if you find yourself at the security con prior to KubeCon coming up in Detroit, please come and play one of our carefully constructed games. Uh, I've done various things. Um, I'm proud to be involved with uh, the CNCF's tag security and also do some work for Open UK, advocating for open source and trying to keep up with the pace of open source awareness that the, the US Biden administration is uh, showing great leadership in at the moment. Uh, I've also written a book recently with my esteemed friend and colleague, Mr. Michael Hasenblas. The first half of the book is available as a free PDF download, uh, which slightly edges the, uh, the printed book because you can just copy and paste the examples. It is written with hacks and YOLO techniques for your Kubernetes clusters and details everything from inside a pod out to compromising a node, a cluster, and ultimately your cloud environment. So today we are going to talk about trust in the context of secrets management and access control, focusing primarily on machine identity, what it is, how we get one, we'll talk about some things that hopefully will be uh, interesting and slightly new, and hopefully things that you can take back and use in the context of your day jobs. So with that, where did we come from? Before cloud, without needing to possess any primary secret material or any knowledge of their own identity. We want identity documents that are short-lived. The acquisition and replacement of them has to be simple, and we want this to be seamless for our workloads, of course. Finally, we need a way for the relying parties to verify these things are correct and the identity documents are valid. So ideally, the basis, of course, for this is cryptography. And the format of choice for these identity documents in the modern age is JWTs or JOTs and X509 certificates. So now we're sold on this concept. How do we get one? We start with something simple that we probably already know. Who's running workloads on Kubernetes? Yeah, the majority, good. And who has heard of the token review API? A few less, yeah. Okay, so we'll dig into this now. Here we have two service accounts. Each one has a token. The subject makes a request, it sends that token in an authorization header, and it uses a secure channel like TLS to protect against interception and replay. The relying party then makes a call to the Kubernetes API server sending the
be in that cryptographic looking string. Uh, does anybody know the serialization format for JOTs? It's a bit bizarre when you base64 decode it, it doesn't quite spit out properly. There is a header, a payload, and a signature. It's base64 and URL encoded, separated with a period halfway through. So we can pipe this through JQ like this and have a look at the payload or the header. We can't decode the signature as it's not UTF-8. But generally, we're only interested in the payload and possibly the header. No more pasting tokens into jwt.io. It's probably not a good idea. So this is the decomposition um, of, we see here the header, we have the algorithm, the Then we see metadata about the pod and the service account and the subject there at the bottom. We have a lot of metadata in here as well. The JSON web key set URL. So this is a set of keys containing the public keys used to verify any jot issued by the authorization service. The EKS payload looks very similar indeed, of course, because it's a standardized format, but we have a different issuer. Um, that is not static, that will change. And the discovery document that goes with it. And again, the EKS JSON web key set. Nothing particularly different in there. One difference here with A.
rather, <laughs> as it mentions. This defines a standard for an identity framework. Spire is a concrete implementation, and these technologies have been going around for a number of years now. Istio implements some form of the Spiffy standard. It's neither complete nor um, absolute, but still goes in the right direction. Exchanging identity for cryptographic material that can be used not only for authorization, but also mutual TLS. So for Spiffy, we are defining the format of an identifier as a URI. And you can see here the Spiffy identity, Spiffy, acne.com, billing, payments, for example. This is baked into uh, an SVID, a Spiffy verifiable identity document. This is then used to, for example, generate an X509 or a JOT, which means that it's cryptographically verifiable um, in various different ways. It can be short-lived and rotated frequently. And um, yeah, as I say, that there's multiple different mechanisms for that SFID to be bundled into. The trust domain just provides the bundle and the root keys to verify the SFID. The workload API then defines a protocol by which to securely retrieve and verify the SFID, which gives us the ability to um, not only mint and generate these certificates, but then those certificates can be used to mutually identify each other when there is a shared root, um, root of trust or a shared public key. So how does this work? Because there's various different implementations. One of the ways is to run a node agent. So a trusted process sat running its root on a node, observing the workloads that are created as unprivileged or processes owned by unprivileged users on the same node and then attesting their identity against the server, exchanging metadata about those processes with the server, which is then minted into a certificate, which is returned, given to the process, and used to bootstrap that workload identity and to also maintain encrypted communication. Workloads attest themselves to the agent, and the registration maps selectors containing metadata specific to the attestation to Spiffy IDs, an apparent Spiffy ID for workload maps workloads on the node so that we know which workloads are allowed to run in which nodes. Workloads can then use the workload API to get their SVIDs. This is not the only way that we can attest to identity. We can also, on the left-hand side, the node-based attestation agent to server. So those top three mechanisms utilize shared secrets, but we also have Kubernetes. Uh, we also have cloud identity documents. So this concept of running a privileged agent process, incidentally, this is all threat modeled. The security properties are published. Tag Security did a review of this a couple of years ago. And the blast radius of various different types of compromise um, is all available to, to download in the Tag Security archives. The principle of having a trusted node agent means that the compromise of that node means an attacker can then mint certificates based upon arbitrary falsified metadata. So there are other ways to do this as well. Of course, that limits the blast radius to the workloads that are permitted to run on that node type. But by extension, some of these cloud provider integrations use metadata about a virtual machine. So instead of having a trusted node an attestation process on every node, on every virtual machine, on every Kubernetes, on every kubelet in the Kubernetes cluster, when attesting to cloud infrastructure, we run that on one dedicated node that uses the AWS or the GCP APIs to retrieve metadata about the virtual machines. That's what's then used as the metadata in the selectors to generate the certificates, and that's what's then pushed to the machines to be used as the basis of identity. So this can be done in other ways for the sake of simplicity, I think especially the way that Istio um, implements this, this style is, again, not with a node tester, but going directly to the Kubernetes API. So there's multiple different ways to, to skin and slice this. Ultimately, the implementation that makes the most sense is dependent on your threat model, of course. We can also do uh, individual workload attestation here. We can use Unix identifiers like user IDs or process names. 
We use group IDs and names. The path to a process is binary. The digest of that binary. We can use for a container the image ID, labels, environment variables if we so choose. And of course, in Kubernetes, service counts, namespaces, images, etc. Then on a single Kubernetes cluster, by extension, we can use the projected service account token node attestation. We're back to the token review API at this point, which is the same as the Vault authentication method earlier. And we then also have the IDC discovery provider exposing our endpoints to retrieve the, doc the discovery documents and the JWKS URL. As it's OIDC discovery, it just looks the same as the previous examples. And we can use it in the same way as a Kubernetes service account jot. So far, we have focused just on the jots. The motivation for this was to demonstrate that we can do a lot with Kubernetes as our IDP, as our identity provider. Spy gives us extra capabilities, but with an administrational and operational overhead. You get these for free on Kubernetes. Again, there is a balance here of operational versus risk. The specific use case will determine your need, but the assumption is for some of this that a service mesh um, is used for secure communication, or at least a mutual TLS exchange, um, or, or indeed just a one-way TLS exchange, as long as there is encryption that prevents the provisioning of these tokens being intercepted, obviously. What if we want the same workload ID in the JOT and the X509? Well, we can also provide the SVID as the X509 document, where the spiffy ID is in the URI SAN, the subject's alternative name. Then we can use for server and client authentication. The certificate can be used for mutual TLS, to log into Vault, or for anything else that supports certificate-based authentication. When we're using this to log into Vault, the question of having a key to unlock the box to get the second key out is fixed because the workload is provisioned a cryptographic identity that it can go to Vault and say, hi, I'm allowed to do this. Vault can then go out of band to the Kubernetes API server or indeed just trust the fact that this is encrypted and encoded into a certificate with a shared public key that's trusted and give that secret zero. This is easier and more stable, in, in my opinion, than um, a lot of the other vault unlock mechanisms um, and doesn't necessarily require so much uh, sort of sidecar mounting as we may have seen. Uh, so yeah, as we say, um, Spire is also implementing the Envoy secret discovery service. So from, a, uh, from an Envoy perspective and then by extension sort of service mesh and Istio, we can integrate with Envoy for TLS and just push that directly into Envoy and optionally OPA for policy-based access control using the spiffy IDs. Okay. We've looked about the software, now perhaps into the hardware. We'll briefly go through, um, and I realize there are uh, people in the room for whom this is a specialist subject, so I won't go too deep into it. Um, an indication of where it looks like workload identity is heading for the rest of us. This is towards trust at the hardware level. This is anchoring and ideally, what we're looking at from a supply chain perspective is anchoring from the Git commit that we make and the cryptographic material that we attach to that commit through into our build system, through interstitially and sort of into build stage um, gathering of signatures with something like Intoto. Tekton Chains will do some of this for us today. Bundling up those signatures into an artifact, which we can then sign with something like Cosign. Notary v2 will do some of these things as well. That then gets pushed to a Kubernetes cluster where admission control says, okay, I trust this signature. I can also unbundle all of the other signatures that have been pushed as metadata alongside this container. And we've got a chain of trust from the GPG key the developer used or the SSH key that they used initially. I think signing git commits is a good thing, but I realize our benevolent leader doesn't necessarily agree. Um, but yes, indeed, signing all of those commits validating all the signatures, and then we have an artifact that is immune to some forms of attack. 
Obviously, a malicious insider is still not prevented by this style of attack, but we are preventing build stage tampering and we're increasing the trust and the veracity of that build as it moves to production and is finally deployed. But what about that workload as it sits in production? We have trusted platform modules, we have cryptographic devices, we have trusted execution environments that take us further into this space. So we're looking at secure generation and storage of keys that never leave a trusted platform module unencrypted. This property allows us to tie things to a specific TPM, as compromised keys cannot be reused in another TPM. We also have uh, this concept of PCRs, platform configuration registers that can be read but not directly written. And as values are extended, we have uh, a new hash which is comprised of a previous hash plus a measurement to offset and change that hash value. This goes a long way to preventing faking and tampering. Um, it's likely that PCRs could well be used for attestation in the future. And Keylime gives or uses IMA measurements stored in those PCRs, which is the integrity measurement architecture. This gives it the ability to continuously verify the integrity of remote machines. And we can, um, in this case, do things like automatically remove a compromised etcd node from a cluster when we detect that there has been um, the uh, integrity is compromised in some way. It is worth noting that the trusted execution environments and enclaves that were shipped in consumer-grade CPUs are being discontinued in the main. Um, Intel have pulled them from the latest generation of processors. Compare and contrast, um, Google have put TPMs into every, every VM that they have on, uh, on Google Cloud. I think they kind of announced that maybe four, four or five years ago. So this is something that's actually more difficult to do um, with a modern CPU than it is with a cloud provider, which is strange for something that's hardware anchored, but, but there we go. Uh, okay, so we also have trusted platform module device ID attestation. We can, um, th these are provisioned out of band. Attestation uses the encrypted keys, which are loaded into the TPM, and includes a challenge that can only succeed with correct keys on the correct machine. It's tied to the TPM so it can't be impersonated, even if the keys are compromised, and it uses a fingerprint of the certificates, like X509, so the default spiffy ID is predictable. This dream of anchoring everything end-to-end -end from commit through to the runtime attestation, anchoring the process to a specific node through the TPM still has a bit of a way to go. There's lots of moving parts, but everything you've seen here is open source, with the exception of the microcode in the TPM. Um, and we're certainly moving towards a brighter future where hopefully we can see these kind of things in production within the next six to 18 months, perhaps. So with that, you might already have a workload identity that satisfies your use case. There are plenty of other flavors. Kubernetes could well be your IDP if you wish it to be. Service account tokens, bound service account tokens are becoming the default. Um, there is a nuance of bound service account tokens, which is because they're temporarily bound, because they have this time, time out and these usage criteria, based temporal usage criteria, they're pushed into a pod on a tempfs partition by the kubelet and then they're rotated. If your application does not reread them from disk every time they're used, your process will start, read its configuration, and when that key is rotated, it will keep on using the old cryptographic information that it pulled at boot time. So applications need to be updated in order to use bound projected service account tokens, various different implementations. I mean, you could either just read that from disk every time, you could have a I notify watch on, on the thing as well and just pull it when it changes. But it's unfortunately not just a drop-in change. Um, of course, secure channel for communication is, is uh, de rigueur. Consider Spiffy Inspire and the next generation of trusted platform modules and Keylime um, are very exciting and uh, looking forward to deploying them. 
And with that, thank you very much for your attention. in that case. <laughs> Thank you very much.